my name is Kara, and I am um, a sex and love addict. Um, and I'm so grateful to be here, and I'm especially grateful to be here um, because I this month is my eighth year anniversary in this program, and this was my first program. So this is just amazing that I was asked to speak um, at this meeting. And um, basically, I'm going to focus on the steps um, on the topic, but just to give you a little bit of a background, um, I came in eight years ago because I just I was I was having suicide ideation. I I was compulsively dating. I was in now I know a, a compulsive. Um, sex and love pattern and basically I came in to I found the program from Google um, because I was bottoming out after every relationship I would go from one to another and it was just getting worse because this disease is pervasive and insidious as we know and so I found this program on Google um, even though I, I was in therapy for many years I, I was going to maybe enabling therapists. So um, the bottom line was, I found this program, I came in, and as soon as I started hearing the message and the topic in the literature, I, I, was, I knew I was home. I mean, I knew this, this was what was wrong with me all of these years. Um, because I basically surrounded myself with, I call them surrogates or metaphors of my family of origin. Right? But I didn't know I was doing that. So after I left my family of origin house and went to college and you know, be, you know, lived as an adult, um, met a husband or two and had friends around me, they were all enablers and basically all addicts. I mean, I'm not even exaggerating. I, I built this layer of, of addicts. Um, and the addictions, I mean, I just like to, you know, there's no judgment on the addiction, but it's just interesting of the kind of addicts that I attracted. You know, basically attracted like love addicts, sex and love addicts, sex addicts, codependents, um, marijuana smokers, and the alcoholic, not a ton of alcoholics, but the alcohol was more of a um, ancillary, um, you know, ancillary addiction, right, that paired with the sex and love addiction. Um, my family of origin, I'm not gonna go into a whole big thing, but I've done, being in program now eight years, I've done a lot of inner child work, family of origin work, and basically, my, I went to a therapist a long time ago, and, and they asked me what was my first memory. My first memory was that I was left, I woke up in a crib, I guess I was under three years old, and in the middle of the night, um, my parents would go to this uh, summer, um, like holiday, like a camp or, or something. I don't know if any of you guys watch Dirty Dancing, but it was like that where, where you know, we would stay in little bungalows and my parents would go to the casino or go dancing or whatever they would do. And basically they were probably in their thirties and I was left alone and I would wake up in the middle of the night calling. And I, I don't think this happened one time. That's what came out in therapy. I think it happened many times, and that's why I be, it became a trauma, and I have PTSD from it. Um, uh, when I confronted my mother later on, she told me that everybody did this. So I put two and two together, and I, I, I call, I, I really feel very grateful that I, I came out of this narcissist, I call it a narcissist cult or a narcissist regime. Um, and I broke out. I am the only one in my family that broke out. And I ended up marrying my first qualifier. Um, I didn't know, obviously, it was a qualifier, but I did end up marrying my first qualifier we, because we did go on and off for about seven times, and I couldn't let him go. He actually received, well, I don't want to say this online, but okay. So, um, yeah, so basically, um, we divorced, and then I, my, this, this disease just got progressively worse. And what's underneath the disease for me is the shame and the abandonment and the unavailability. I constantly um, look for unavailable partners. I call them the available unavailables, right? Because they just seem so available. They, they, they keep coming back. It's the gift that keeps giving, but however, 
there's no relationship. I would call it the non-relationships. Um, and it was so painful. And, um, I, I, you know, I couldn't take it anymore. Yeah. So basically, um, I realized that a lot of um, my, uh, my codependence and enmeshment came from the anxious attachment. And, and, you know, I could swing from being a love avoidant and a love addict. And I also have the narcissist tendencies too. You know, I was taught very well from, I had good training to be a narcissist, right? Um, I, I feel like the narcissist thing is a spectrum and we all have that and we could go, you know, from one side to the other. And I would take hostages, you know, I would. I mean, I, I would have like the addict would take me as a hostage, but I can be a hostage taker as well. Um, and all of it is just for me not to feel my feelings, not to be with myself, not to um, parent myself. And, you know, it just, I, I totally hit bottom. I hit bottom financially. I, this was my, this disease was my job. This was my job, whereas my real career was my hobby. And I would literally sit in my office and I was in fantasy addiction. I was in validation addiction. Um, instead of counting how much money I had in the bank, I would count how many dates I would have. <laughs> like, when's the last time I saw this one? I would keep logs of, you know, I think it says that in the big book too. You know, we, we you know, I would track and and do, you know, keep logs of, of um, how many dates I would have with this person, how many times I saw that person, you know, where I went, you know, who the whole thing. But did I even know how much money I had? Could I pay my bills? Um, I maxed out my credit cards, had to borrow against my 401k. And it just um, it progress progressively, you know, kept, just kept dropping, dropping, dropping. And I'm so grateful. Um, I'll have, I have to mention that my best friend was murdered from her ex-fiance. And I testified at, at her try at the trial. Like this is real stuff. You know, we this this disease is is deadly. Like they they say that the steps are um, for the steps help us with suicide. What is it? The traditions are with homicide, and the concepts are for genocide. And I totally understand that now. Um, so I came into program eight years ago. Uh, the first two years I was slipping and sliding. I had about three sponsors because I kept on attracting sponsors that were just like my qualifiers and my ex-husbands. Um, it was miraculous, right, how we do that. And I I stayed so close to program. Um, this was before Zoom, so every day I was on a meeting. I was listening to meetings in my ear, you know, while I was working, while I was walking around. Um, I, I just, you know, it, something I reflected on the other day where I was thinking when I grew up in the house of, of or family origin, my father was a sports addict and either every, you know, sport was on the TV or radio, whether it was football, golf, baseball, and my mother, would, the TV was on in the background, they would fall asleep to the TV, um, the radio was on, and that's all they listened to. And then here I am, you know, thankfully in program, I'm listening to meetings 24-7. So I think it's interesting, like I was never modeled to be able to sit by myself and sit with my own feelings. Um, so I, that, I just realized that. Um, so after getting into program, I met really amazing fellows. And I would go to fellowship. We had so much fun. I mean, Friday and Saturday night, we were out from at least like 4 o'clock. We would go to meetings, and I wouldn't get home till 11 o'clock. I immersed myself so much in, in fellows and meetings, fellowship, and I started doing the steps. And one time I was on a meeting, a phone meeting, and I was listening. Um, they didn't know I was on the phone meeting, and I heard two people talking, and this one man was telling this woman, you have to do the steps. You can't just go to meetings. If you go to meetings, you're gonna relapse and you'll, you, you will die. You, you have to do the steps. And when I heard that, I just scared myself into a panic. I'm like, I have to do the steps. I have to find a sponsor. I mean, I heard this person, 
say, like, you, you know, coming to meetings is great and it's fellowship, but it's really step zero or step one, and it's not until we do the step work. Recovery is in the step work. That's, and that's 10 minutes. Sorry? That's, that's 10 minutes. Okay, great. Thank you. So I, I started doing the step work, and yes, step three, um, I totally believe in that. You know, I am powerless. I do have a higher power. I realize my higher power is my loving parent, is my higher self. Um, I'm not religious, um, I, I, so that wasn't an issue for me. But so whether I say God or higher parent, higher power, I mean, whatever it is, um, my step three is yes. I turn darkness into light. I turn sadness into joy. I I say the serenity prayer. I um, I just ask for God's help. I ask for direction. Um, I. I actually was in, I was on a European journey in September and I bought tickets like flying into Paris and flying out of Paris in the spring. And I had no idea what I was going to do on this trip. And basically I just said, I'm going to give it up to God. I'm just going to let God decide how this trip is going to go. I mean, I, it sounds really weird for me to say this out loud, um, but it's true. I just totally gave it up. and. And you know, if I told like my core friends what I was doing, I would have gotten such like negative feedback. Like, how could you not know where you're going? Like, I would have been shamed, right, for not knowing where I'm going, not having a plan, not blah blah blah. But I basically, you know, let it go. I'm like, let's see, something will evolve. You know, uh, I don't know. I'll figure things out. And it was incredible how my trip for three weeks just totally worked itself out. Um, and I even, you know, came to a London meeting and I, I qualified at a London meeting, which I never thought I would do. I mean, amazing. So, um, but that's all because I really like let that compulsiveness go. I let the anxiety go. I let the having to figure it out go. Um, I let my ego go, right? I, you know, I, I didn't control anything. Um, yeah, so I really believe in, in step three. Um, I think it's the gateway to the steps, right? It's a gateway to doing the step work. Like when they say step work, it is like work. We're working the steps. Um, and when I did step four, step four was amazing to see all my character defects and, and everything like that. And while, you know, doing step four and step five, and, you know, I always, when I would share at meetings, I say how beautiful step six and seven. Six and seven, I think, are the most unspoken, unmentioned steps, especially in in, um, in the meetings I go to. Um, no one really talks about it, and it's such a beautiful step. And um, being able to recognize my character defects and recognize what triggers me and recognize my part and what I do, and then being able to turn it over and ask, my higher power, right, as going back to whoever my higher power is, to release my defects um, and my shortcomings and to recognize what coping, negative coping methods I am using and to ask for that to be removed is just remarkable, right? It's remarkable. Um, so I'm also in a, uh, was in a step family lineage and when I, got to step nine, we would do the, um, you're allowed to, to date, but step 9.5, we're allowed to date. And I thought that was so important to, to, you know, before dating, to do step six and seven, because, because how could you date and how could you even have relationships with people when you're, you're still not recognizing your defects of character? And I know that sounds like, you know, some people don't like to say defects of character, but, but it's our, basically our, our coping skills, right? So, and my coping skills, the what I learned growing up was manipulation, triangulation, control, betrayal, abandonment, right, shame, um, all of that. So I, it's like a, a Latin lo, um, novella. Like I know how to do all those things. And if I'm in a relationship and I'm doing those things, thank God for step seven because I could just, you know, take a step back and ask my higher power to remove those things. And whether I'm in fear um, or self-loathing or, you know, um, just misery, 
I could ask for those things to be removed. And will they be removed? I mean, it's a practice, right? But at least taking the action of asking them to be removed is the first step, right? That's and fine. I think that all ties... That's sorry. fine, Ms. Lett. Okay. I think that all ties into um, step 11, right? Step 11 is basically prayer and meditation. It's really interesting how these steps are all organized. Um, so I definitely included prayer and med meditation into my daily life. And, you know, again, it's this is all progress, not perfection. We all do it differently, and it's okay. Um, I wake up in the morning, and I read some literature. You know, in the past, right, before, and I hear it from my, my addict friends, in the first thing in the morning, they'll just wake up and go on a dating app, right? They'll go on, you know, social media. Um, so thank God, like, I don't do that, you know? Thank God I have this way of, like, waking up in the morning and, and going through my, my gratitudes, going through my aff affirmations, turning over something to myself, getting in touch with how I feel, um, you know, leaving a voice, mo voice note for my sponsor, um, and do praying, right, meditating. And it's a morning prayer, and it can look however it can. You know, sometimes it can be a minute, sometimes it can be five minutes, and etc. cetera. Um, and it's not perfect by any means. Um, but it's it's definitely, you know, it's definitely the way to keep me sober. And every day is a daily reprieve because every day I wake up, I'm going to treat it. Every day I wake up, and it's me. Wherever I am, I go. When I was in Europe traveling, I really was in touch with, with who I am. And I basically said to myself, I'm okay. All I need is a passport. I, have my, I would say to myself, I have my passport. I have my credit card. Um, I have my phone. There's nothing else that I needed at all. It was incredible to be like really in touch and be so grounded with, with that. And I also do the praying and meditation whenever I'm getting stressed during the day. Um, and I have a nightly routine as well to go over how my day was, you know, incorporating the step 10. Um, so how many, how many minutes do I have? Where's the some time? You have two and a half. Two minutes, you said? Two, two and a half minutes. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so yeah, so all those things I do and I think are really important. And just to go on to the wrapping up part, um, I am, I run a rigorous program, probably not like as much as the HAL program because we, we just do it probably a little differently. Um, but I, I have sponsees, I have a sponsor, I work the steps constantly. Um, I'm sober dating, which is really challenging, and sober dating is really important. And actually, getting a sp having sponsees is actually really important because that's how we, in this program, we mirror in intimacy. In this program, we learn intimacy, but with our sponsees. And it's so important to have a sponsee, to break up with a sponsee, to recognize what triggers us. Um, so that's really important to have sponsees in this program. And I'm sober dating, which also brings a whole host of other feelings. And for example, um, you know, recently I went back into romantic, I found myself going in, into romantic obsession again. And I realized that, um, you know, when I, when something happened from a date, I'm able to, to tap into that it's not about that person. That person is just a metaphor is basically just a surrogate of my mother and my father rejecting me and abandoning me. It's not about the date. I don't even know this, this person. How do you go out with somebody for two times and know them? Um, but I'm able to touch in, One to tap back. into, okay, well, I'm able to tap into when my father would shame me or abandon me or give me the cold shoulder and how painful that was. And then when a, like a, a sober date does that, like, wow, it's not about this sober date, but I could go back and tell myself that I'll be okay, I'm okay, right? That's the bottom line, that we need to tell ourselves, we're okay, we will be okay, everything is good. Honestly, if someone said to me, would you trade your life for something right now? No, I would keep my life right now as it is. Um, 
And this program saved my life. A hundred thousand percent, this program saved my life. This disease is painful, it's deadly. Um, what else? And I thank you for listening. I look forward to hearing from everybody. And thank you so much for having me share.